Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithful love. God, you are the God who is everywhere at all times, oh God. And Lord, we celebrate your presence here in this room, but in the rooms of every person who's watching, whatever time they're watching, God, your presence is with them as well, oh God. Lord, and I speak your blessings into their lives right now in the name of Jesus. Lord God, every person who's watching at home or wherever they are, God, I just speak your blessings over them. Lord, we release your blessings of life and love and blessings and life and truth, oh God, into their lives. Lord, we thank you for your faithful love, God. There's nowhere that we can go where you're not there. Lord, there's no time when you're not there. Lord God, you are faithful. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We lift up your name. We praise your name. We give glory to your name, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Right. Hello, everybody. Hello, everyone watching online at home, on your phones, on your computers, on your TVs, wherever you are. Welcome to New Life Fellowship. Welcome to church. We want to thank you guys for joining with us, and we hope that you've been blessed uh, with the worship like we have here, and we hope that you'll be blessed uh, with the word here today as well. What we're going to be talking about today... Just grab a few things here. What we're going to be talking to, about today is we're going to continue our series on the Ten Commandments. We've been enjoying ourselves walking through uh, the series on the Ten Commandments uh, and just talking about God's principles that He has for us through these Ten Commandments. Um, the first one that we talked about, the first command of God, was the principle of of, pure, of priority. Second principle was the principle of purity. The third is the principle of humility. The fourth is the principle of rest. And the fifth is the principle of honor that we did last week. Today, what we're going to be talking about is the sixth command. And that sixth command is the principle of love. The principle of love. So, if you're at home watching, what we'd love for you to do is grab your Bibles, grab a notebook. This is not entertainment. This is not watching a video on YouTube. This is not for you to be entertained, but for you to be blessed, for you to study with us. So grab your Bible, grab a notebook, take notes, and whatever God's speaking to you, just write it down and so that you can just receive a lot from this, and hopefully God will speak something specifically to you today. So if we open our Bibles to Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, there's a very, very short command. Four words. You shall not murder. You shall not murder. That is the sixth command. The sixth command. So we know, as we've studied in the past few weeks, that these principles are not things that we need to do. It's not a checklist to do, okay, I did that, I did that, I did that. It's not a checklist that we do in order to receive salvation. We're all sinful. We see that in the book of Romans. Every man has fallen short. The glory of God, every person, we all have sinned. But God does not expect us to keep the commands in order to receive salvation. He did that on the cross. He redeemed us. He saved us. He gave of his blood for our redemption, for our lives, for our salvation. And so that salvation is only in Christ alone. We can't do that. The minute we begin to think that we can earn our salvation, we're living in deception. That's nothing that we can do. But these principles in the Ten Commandments, <clears throat> these principles are principles and how we can live in good relationships. And the first few commands are talking about our relationship with God. And the following ones are talking about our relationship with others, how we can have a good relationship with others. And the command, you shall not murder, is obviously a good command for us to have 
good relationships with people. You can't have a good relationship with someone after you murder them. That's not possible, okay? So in order to have a good relationship with them, we have to keep them alive, okay? So you shall not murder. Let's have good relationships. But why is this the principle of love? Well, what we're going to do today is we're going to look at six different points. The first four points are looking backwards from murder and how things develop into murder, what comes before murder, and then all the way down, and then we'll find out some of the things that might actually be in some of our hearts that we can think, oh, wow, I'm kind of on that road a little bit. Let's ask God to change us. Let's ask God to make us more like him. So why is this the principle of love? Well, murder is a result of hate. Murder is a result of hate. And if love is the opposite of hate, God says do not murder or do not hate, that could be the principle of love. This makes us the principle of love. So how can we love each other becomes the opposite of you shall not murder. How do we think the best about people? How do we have good relationships with people? How do we put other people first? This is this principle of love. I want to look at a couple of verses. 1 John 3.15. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. So see that connection there? Right away. Hate, murder. Hate, murder. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Okay? Now let's look at the next slide. Romans th chapter 13, verse 9. It says, For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. When Jesus gave the greatest commandments, they were two. The first one is... Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. This is what Paul is talking about here in chapter 13 of Romans. And so Jesus added at the end, if you fulfill those two commands, love God, love others, like you love yourself, then you will fulfill all of the commands. And, Ro and Paul is bringing this out in Romans chapter 13. So we see the 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 relationship with others. These are the relationship with other commands. Murder, commit adultery, covet, all of those. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so we see that here. That murder is connected to hate, and love is the opposite of hate. So the first point that we want to, to, to look at is hate precedes murder. So we're working our way back from murder. Okay, so we have murder. And what's the next step before murder? Because you don't want to get to murder. You want to kind of knock it off before we get there. Because uh, we don't, you know, the command says don't murder. But hate precedes murder. Okay, so hate is what precedes murder. Now let's look at Genesis chapter 37. This is a story of Joseph and his brothers. Okay, so what happened is Joseph was the favored son of his dad. He got a coat of many colors, and he had these dreams. And he told his brothers these dreams. And the dreams were basically, you guys are going to be bowing down to me. And then the second dream was similar to that, but it wasn't just his brothers, but it was his mom and his dad too. And they were dreams from the Lord, and Joseph told his brothers all the dreams that happened, and they began to hate him. Okay? Let's read here. In Genesis 37, verses 4 to 5, when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than, they, more than all his brothers, they hated him. Okay, remember this. They hated him. Okay? And they could not speak peacefully to him. Now, Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. So he was the favored son of his dad. His brothers hated him for it. And then he says, hey, guys, I had this dream. And the hatred only increased, okay? Now, we skip down a little bit in the same chapter, Genesis 37, verse 18. 
they were out with their flocks, and uh, their dad said, okay, Joseph, go see what your brothers are up to. So he went out, and then this is what happened. The brothers saw Joseph coming from a long ways away, saw him coming from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. So see that? So in verses 4 and 5, they hated him. And then this leads to, in verse 18, they wanted to kill him. And we know as the story goes on, one of the brothers changed their minds and they ended up uh, selling him. And uh, he ended up in Egypt. But we see here that hatred comes before murder. Hatred comes before murder. And I want to read a couple more verses. This is from the law in Deuteronomy. Now, in Deuteronomy, you know, we have our Ten Commandments, or in Exodus, we have our Ten Commandments. Deuteronomy, chapter 5, we also have the Ten Commandments. But there's also other laws in there as well, the kind of guidelines to live by uh, with those uh, Ten Commandments as well. And I want to read a couple of them, one in Deuteronomy and another one in Joshua. And so what they, what they did in those, in, those, um, in those books is as they were establishing the nation of Israel, as they were going into the promised land, becoming their own country, they were building their cities, they were uh, you know, taking over from some of their enemies, they were having their own cities. But what ended, up, what ended up happening is God told them, in your country, in the land of Israel, make a few cities that would be called the cities of refuge. And the cities of refuge would be places that people can go when they have done something wrong to somebody accidentally. And usually it was like a murder, you killed somebody, or it wasn't murder, it was you ended up killing somebody by accident. It wasn't premeditated murder. It was something that happened, an accident. But then someone, or maybe a, a, a relative of that guy who died, was angry, and he wanted to take your life as a result of what you did accidentally to them. And so they made these cities of refuge that you can run to, and they would accept you into that city, and then the, high, the priest there would meet with you and judge whether you're, uh, it was all premeditated or not. And if he said, if he said no, it wasn't uh, premeditated, then we would protect you in that city. That would be a, a place where you can stay. And the guy who was, uh, they called him the avenger of blood, the guy who was coming to avenge that person's blood, he couldn't touch you in that city. So this is, let me read you a couple of verses in Deuteronomy chapter 19 and then Joshua 20 about these. But if anyone hates his neighbor, okay, so look at, look at how it says it here. If anyone hates his neighbor and lies in wait for him. So this is the premeditated murder part. And attacks him and strikes him fatally so that he dies and he flees into one of these cities. Then the elders of his city shall send and take him from that city and hand him over to the avenger of blood, so that he may die. So, if, so the, the premeditation part is the hatred. If you hate someone, you kill them, then you're a murderer. But Joshua, in, uh, Joshua 20, verses 3 and 5 says, that the manslayer who strikes any person without intent or unknowingly may flee there. They shall be for you a refuge from the avenger of blood. And if the avenger of blood pursues him, they shall not give up the manslayer into his hand because he struck his neighbor unknowingly and did not hate him in the past. Okay, so this is very key. We see the connection between hatred and murder in the Old Testament. We see it in the story of Joshua, but we also see it in the law as well. Whereas if someone hates them, hates a person, kills them, that equals murder. So hatred precedes murder. Okay, point number two. Okay, so we have hate precedes murder, and then what comes before hate is anger. Anger precedes hate. Okay? The first murderer. The first murderer in the Old Testament was Cain. Okay, let's read this in Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 to 8. In the course of time... Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. 
So Cain was very angry. Okay, so we see that Cain was angry and his face fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? God continues talking to Cain. He says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? So God tells him, this is what you need to do. You'll be accepted. Everything will be good. But if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Sin is crouching at the door. Anger is crouching at the door. And its desire is against you or contrary to you. But you must rule over it. Anger is crouching at the door. Then Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. So in the first murder, we see, we see the anger and we see the hatred and we see the murder. Excuse me. Anger is an emotion. The Bible also says that we can be angry and do not sin. Some things that you can be angry about. Injustices. Things that are wrong against people that you know and love. Or people that are downtrodden. People that are victims. It's okay to be angry about things. And even anger can motivate someone into action. But that action can't be sin. It needs, to be, it needs to be fighting on somebody's behalf for something that has happened. But in our context here, anger leads to hatred, leads to murder. So anger precedes hate. Hate precedes murder. Okay? S sometimes we can have unresolved anger in our lives. And anger is an emotion. Sometimes anger is just something that shows you that there's something wrong inside of you. Those emotions are there. Why does that start to come up inside of you? Well, maybe you need to not look so much around you, but look inside of you. What is God trying to bring to the surface there that he wants to show you, that he wants to change in you, that he wants to correct in you, he wants you to grow? Those anger emotions can be good if we follow them to the Lord and follow them in the right way. But if we're going to blow up and if we're going to say to, you know, that anger sits in there and all of a sudden, you know, we just explode at somebody and do something wrong and sinful, even with our words, not just our actions. But we need to be careful about that anger that's sitting inside of us. So we know that Hate precedes murder. Anger precedes hate. What precedes anger? Point number three, an offense. An offense precedes anger. Listen to this verse in Mark chapter 6, verses 2 to 3. It's talking about Jesus and his ministry. It says, On the Sabbath, Jesus began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished. Okay, sometimes we think the word astonished means, oh, wow, in awe of somebody or in awe of something. This is a little bit different of a Greek word. It's astonished, meaning like not always in the context of something great. It means like, wow, what's almost in an angry sort of way. They're getting riled up because of what they have heard Jesus teach. They said, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James? And look what it says at the end. And they took offense at him. They took offense at Jesus. So Jesus was there, and he was preaching and he was teaching and the, it, the wisdom that he was sharing was something amazing and something that they never heard before. Other passages talk about Jesus. They, they asked, where did he get this authority? He, he, taught, he, taught the, he taught the word of God with authority. But here it says they were astonished and they took offense at Jesus. They took offense at Jesus. They were, they got offended at Jesus because of what he was doing, because of his ministry. They were offended at him. 
In another passage in Luke chapter 4, verses 28 to 29. Jesus went into the synagogue, and this is the famous passage where he opened up the scroll of Isaiah. He opened up the scroll of Isaiah, and he said, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. Recovery of sick, uh, 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 recovery of those who are sick, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. All of that, he, 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 he read from the scroll of Isaiah. It was the prophecy. And the people in that synagogue, the Pharisees and the scribes, they all knew that this prophecy of Isaiah was about the Messiah. It was about the Messiah, about the one to come from the Jewish nation who would rise up and bring freedom to the captives. He would heal the sick and they would recover, lay his hands on the blind and they would see. This is what the prophet Isaiah spoke of. But Jesus said, today this is fulfilled among you. And they were mad. They were ticked off. Because they, we know, we know where you come from. You're just, you're just Jesus. You're just the carpenter's son. You're not the Messiah. And it says they took him out to the cliff to toss him off the cliff because they were so mad. They were so offended at him. They said, we're going to get rid of this guy. He's a... But then he just kind of managed to get away from them and worked his way through the crowds and escaped. But they were so mad at him that they wanted to kill him. They were offended at him. So what brings offense in our lives. Where, where would these people get so offended that they wanted to kill Jesus? Where? Well, what precedes an offense is unfulfilled expectations. Have you guys ever had an expectation that didn't come to pass? You guys sitting at home. Have you ever had an expectation that you were expecting something and it didn't happen. A lot of times we think, man, I want this or I'm expecting this. I expect this person to do that or I expect this person to do that. Or they should have done this or they should have done that. Didn't happen. And that's a, an unfulfilled expectation. And those things can make us offended. Those things can make us mad. And this is exactly exactly what was happening when Jesus spoke of, of himself from the book of Isaiah. They were expecting the Messiah, and Jesus said, I am him. That was an unfulfilled expectation. There's another passage that talks about someone who had an expectation. Let's think about the life of John the Baptist. So that's just kind of a brief snapshot of his life. Six months old. Okay, he was in the womb of his mom, okay, Elizabeth. And when Mary, who was conceived with Jesus by the Holy Spirit, came into the room, it says John, uh, 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 John the Baptist started jumping inside of Elizabeth's womb. John the Baptist knew Jesus even before he was even born. He was even born. He responded to the presence of Jesus in Elizabeth's womb. Later on, we see John the Baptist was baptizing in the wilderness. What did John the Baptist say? He said, he saw Jesus come and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He said, Everybody, look, here he comes. It's Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is what John the Baptist said. He declared it. And then John, later on, Jesus came to get baptized by John. John said, no, Jesus, I, don't, I shouldn't be baptizing you. You should baptize me because you're the one. You're the one. You are the Messiah. You are the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist's whole ministry, he even said it himself. He said, I'm only here to make the way ready. I'm only here. The things that I'm doing is just saying, get ready because Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. And later on, we see John the Baptist say, I am not worthy 
to even stoop down and untie Jesus' shoelaces. That was, the, that was the job of the lowliest of servants. John the Baptist is saying, I'm not even worthy to be the lowliest, lowliest of servants to Jesus. And he said, and then later on, Jesus was baptizing people, and John's disciples came to John and said, hey, look, you know, Jesus, he's baptizing more than you. And John said, you know what? It's okay. He must increase. I must decrease. These are all the things that John the Baptist said. But look at something that happened here. In Luke chapter 7, I'm just going to read this. But I want you to see, this is the same John, okay? John was in prison, okay? John was in prison. John's disciples told John all about the things, these things. So then John summoned two of his disciples and sent them to Jesus, asking him, are you the one? You catch that? Jesus, John said to Jesus, are you the one? Are you the one? Well, well, John's whole ministry up till that point, he's the one, he's the one, he's the one. Lift him up. He's greater than I am. He's the one. And then when he's in prison, Jesus, are you really the one? Are you the one? And this is what Jesus respond. Go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. Those with leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor are told the good news. In verse 23, listen to what Jesus says. And blessed are those, or blessed is the one who isn't offended by me. So Jesus said to John, these are all the things that are happening. You know, the, the lepers are being cleansed, the blind are seeing, the deaf are hearing, the good news is being preached. But don't be offended. Don't be offended. I think John probably had some expectations of Jesus. Here he is. John is in prison. The cousin of Jesus. Jesus is out doing all this ministry. And why didn't Jesus come to visit John in prison? Why didn't Jesus do a miracle and, you know, crash the bars of the prison and miraculously set John free. Maybe John had these expectations. Jesus said, don't be offended. I think sometimes, sometimes in our Christian life, we can have expectations. And I think God's re just reminding us, he says, I'm God. Don't be offended at me. Don't be offended at the way that I do things. Trust me. Even if things don't work out just the way that you think they should, or even when things are difficult in your life, or you, you know, send your disciples to me and really wonder if you're the one, don't let your offense turn into doubt. Don't let your offense turn into doubt. John the Baptist was offended because he had improper expectations, un un unmet expectations. And as a result, his faith began to shake and said, Jesus, are you the one? Are you really the one? I said it all this time, but are you really the one? His faith was starting to shake during that time. And I feel like we need to be on guard. We have to guard our hearts with the things that happen in our life. Because sometimes... We're expecting something. We want something. And things don't work out just the way. And we can get offended through unmet expectations. But let's guard our hearts. So we see the line here. Unfulfilled expectations leads to offense. Offense leads to anger. Anger produces hate. And hate leads to murder. But what is the key to short-circuiting that whole line? And it's love. That's why we've called this the principle of love. Point number five, forgiveness precedes love. Forgiveness precedes love. And along any of those, along anywhere in that line, whether it's anger or offense or unmet expectations, forgiveness 
is the key to getting back to love. And I don't have a lot of time to uh, go into everything about forgiveness. We actually preached on forgiveness back in October, I think October the 6th, uh, in our relationship series. So if you guys want to go back, you can look at that uh, from October 6th of last year. We did a whole, whole message on forgiveness, and I would encourage you, if you're struggling with forgiveness, need to want to learn more about that, go back and, and, and listen to that message because it's online there. But forgiveness precedes love. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 to 44 says, You have heard it said, and this is, the, this is what Jesus was just repeating a, a, a common saying in Israel at that time. You have heard it said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That was their saying. Yeah, love your neighbor. Okay, that's good. But it's okay to hate your enemy. Jesus says, Nope. Nope, because hate leads to murder. Let's short circuit that. Jesus says, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Hate leads to murder, but forgiveness leads to love. And I think even with, you know, going back, looking at expectations, I think sometimes I've never heard anybody preach on this before, but I think sometimes in our own hearts, we need to forgive God in our own hearts. Because I think sometimes we, you know, God doesn't do anything wrong, so it's not like we're forgiving him for a sin that he does. But I think sometimes we need to say, you know, okay, God, I forgive this, or I let go of my expectations. I'm sorry for these expectations that I had. And I say, okay, God, I'm just going to leave it. When we talked about forgiveness, forgiveness actually means to leave something. We left everything. Forgiving means you're taking something and you're leaving it, not going back to it. When we have these unmet expectations, we're leaving it. We're saying, okay, no, I'm going to walk away from these expectations. God is a good God. God has not done wrong to me. God is a good God, and so I'm going to leave those aside, and I'm going to walk in love. But sometimes the unmet expectations are wrongs that people do to you. You know, we never have to forgive somebody when they do something good to us. You know, if somebody, you know, bakes me a batch of cookies, I'm not going to say, oh, I forgive you for baking cookies for me. No, you don't have to do that. You're like, oh, man, this is awesome. I got cookies. We don't have to forgive people when they do good stuff to us, but forgiveness is something that happens in the midst of the hurt because forgiveness is always forgiveness for something wrong, something bad, something painful. But it's the first step to love. And what precedes forgiveness is grace. Grace precedes forgiveness. Forgiveness is giving grace to somebody. But if you haven't received grace, it's, you can't give grace. If you, if you don't have an experience with grace, if you haven't experienced grace from your Heavenly Father, if you haven't experienced forgiveness from Jesus, if you haven't experienced that grace, you, it's really, really hard to give grace. You can say, I forgive you, but you're still holding that hurt in your heart. Grace comes through us. We receive it, and then we can give it. Grace comes through us. And so, in order for us to forgive others and live in love truly, we need to receive the grace from our Heavenly Father. He's got boundless grace, unlimited grace, a grace that does, has no boundaries. God doesn't say, I'll forgive you for this, but oh, I can't forgive that one. No, that's not, God doesn't keep a record of rights and wrongs. He's, he's, he's gracious. We say, for God, forgive us. And for some reason, even when we don't, maybe when we don't mean it 100%, God says, I love you. I love you. I want you to experience grace. God wants us to live a life of grace every day. His mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. 
God wants us to live a lifestyle of grace. So when you do wrong, God forgives. When you make a mistake, His grace is there. But that's also how we can live in love with other people. When other people do wrong to us, that grace should be there. That love should be there. That mercy should be there as well. You know, the word offense, it means a stumbling stone. It can also mean like a stick. And I, I brought this box up here. Let me just show you this here at the end. I don't know if you guys have ever done this as kids, but sometimes what people do is they put a little stick under a box like this. Maybe they put a little treat under there for an animal to crawl under. Maybe a, a I don't know, a cat or something like that. You want to catch it? And then, then when the animal goes under, you got this string here. And then you, when the animal goes under, you pull the string out and then catch the animal in the box. One of the words for offense is the word scandalon. And it actually means this little stick. A stick to trap somebody. Or like a snare. Sometimes when you people bend a small tree over and tie a rope around it, and then it shoots up, it grabs. It's a trap. An offense is a trap. It's like a stumbling stone. And sometimes people don't forgive, but they stay trapped. They're the ones who are trapped. They're the ones who are stuck under the box trying to get out. Or maybe it's like a stumbling stone and some people, they pick up the stone and they carry it around in their pocket with them. And so they got this stone. And sometimes you meet people. And they tell you about their stone that they're carrying around. Oh, this person did this to me. This person did that to me. I remember when this person, they tell everybody, it's like a prized stone for them. Yeah, but it's a stumbling stone. Then you ask them, how, how long ago did that happen? Oh, 20 years ago. I'm like, and you're still carrying it around? Because they haven't learned to forgive. And they stay trapped for all those 20 years with an offense and they don't live their lives. Forgiveness helps us to live in love, but it also helps us to live in freedom as well because you're not talking about it over and over and over. I have a friend, lots of times when we get together with him, he'll talk about, oh, this happened and that happened. We're like, yeah, so many years ago. Just get over it. Forgive. Get on with your life. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to live in love, wants us to live in liberty, wants us to live in freedom. God is so good to us. In order to live in love, we need to forgive. In order to forgive, we need to experience grace and give that grace to others. And as we do, we can short circuit. We can get out of the, the pathway to murder. Okay, remember? Murder, hate, anger, offense, unmet expectations. But forgiveness cuts through all of that. And we can live in the liberty. We can live in the joy. We can live in the freedom that God has for us. And this is God's principle of love. Amen? Let's pray. And I just want to speak to all of you guys online. If you need any prayer, please contact us at New Life Fellowship. Contact us through our Facebook page. Comment on these videos. Say, man, I need someone to pray with me. We would love to. We have a team ready. We have a team who's wanting to, to connect with you and to pray with you, to share with you, to help you through these times. And let's stay connected. We know with all of the stuff that's going on in the world, in the world it's hard to you know, everybody's, keep your distance, keep your distance. But let's keep our distance maybe to, for 
this virus and everything, but let's stay connected as a church. Let's stay connected in love. Don't forget about church. Don't forget about your Christian brothers and sisters, but let's stay connected. We would love to hear from you. Comment on this. Uh, private message us so that we can pray with you if that's what you need to do because we want to all continue to grow. We don't want to take a, a vacation from church. We don't want to take a vacation from God, but we want to continue to grow together. So please do that. We'd love to connect with you. But let's pray as we close here. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for your love for us. And God, it's a love that is as big as you are, as great as you are, as strong as you are, as unchanging as you are. And we put our hope in your love. And your word says, whoever puts their hope in you will never be put to shame. So today, God, we put our hope in you. We put our love in you. We put our trust in you. Holy Spirit, we invite you to work in our hearts right now, wherever we are, work in our hearts. If there's anger, if there's offense, if there's unmet expectations, God, reveal it to us because we don't want to live trapped. We don't want to carry the rock of offense around with us all the time. We want to let it go. We want to forgive it. We want to leave it so that we can walk into the destiny that you have for us, oh God. So God, reveal it to us in your grace and mercy. Reveal it to us. And Lord God, we say, God, forgive us. Forgive us for carrying around those offenses. Forgive us when we blamed you, when we had unmet expectations. Forgive the people that have offended us, oh God. And may we live a life of liberty. We commit our lives to you, and we commit our lives to living a life of grace. In Jesus' name we pray, God. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week. We'll see you guys all next week.